Today we're looking at how to create an interior design niche. And you've probably heard that saying, if you're marketing to everybody, you're marketing to nobody. And it really rings true. What an interior design niche does for you is creates an area of specialization. And um, it's kind of the part of an interior design that you love, that you're really good at, your skills that help you stand out from the other interior designers in your area or in the same niche as you. So why do we need to kind of do this and why is it a little bit more difficult for interior designers than perhaps other professions? Well, I think traditionally interior designers used a, a, a specialist style or a really unique style and they led with that style. It's not that these days, not every interior designer has a style and the way that they describe what they do is a little bit more complex, perhaps like biophilic design or sustainable design or technical design or project management. And these things aren't visual. They're not a specific style, but you can still obviously become a, a fantastic and successful interior designer without having a specific style. You just still need to market to a group of people who understand and want those things that you're offering, but also need to know how to say that to somebody so that people know what it is that you're actually doing. So that's what we're going to focus on today. Five really simple steps. Of course, it's not going to be the same for everybody. And I think this is where um, niching can be really quite complex and a little bit more difficult. It isn't sometimes really obvious what um, your niche is, but we're going to break it down. We're just going to go through the steps and maybe you might have to do the exercise twice, but that's okay. Do it once. It's okay for now. And I think this is where, um, uh, especially at the beginning of your business or if something's changed in your business and you're ready to um, look at a different niche. I've changed niches twice in my career now, possibly three times now that I think about it. Um, and it doesn't affect you adversely as long as you know what you're doing. So you have to be really clear about your, where you're pivoting and why you're doing it. And, or if you're just starting up, what it is, um, who it is that you're marketing to um, and what it is that they want from you and what it is that you can offer them. So let's get into it. The first step is to create or decide on a unique selling point. This is, or a USP, this is really um, just getting to know yourself and what makes you different. I usually create a list of all of the things that, um, all of my skills, all of my personality traits and all of the things that I like to do, also my interests, because these really just create a kind of recipe for myself. And um, obviously I don't use them all, but at least it starts to help me highlight things that might have similarities or where it starts to create a kind of an interest um, that I actually find that I want to focus on perhaps. Um, well, for me, it was always creativity and being open minded and obviously leading with my personality because my clients, I, I didn't, I wasn't leaving with a style, but my clients loved working with me specifically because I was easygoing, I was open minded, I had a lot of skills and I could always solve the problem um, no matter what it was and how complicated it was because um, I had a lot of experience, but also a lot of people skills at the time who were dealing with contractors and builders and um, everybody else on the building sites that uh, we just got along really well and we got the problem solved. So having that kind of um, personality was actually a, a really fantastic uh, trait to lead with, but it wouldn't have been obvious at the beginning that that was going to inform part of my niche, that um, uh, an, an easygoing Aussie was uh, one of the things that my clients were looking for here in the UK. <laughs> so don't over or don't underestimate skills and personality traits and interests because even though you might not be completely um, uh, uh, like an expert in something you're interested in, you're going to naturally find it a lot easier to undertake those tasks. So I wouldn't dismiss them yet, especially for your early days of your career. Um, if you have an interest in something like sustainable design, it's an easy one to pick out. Um, and although you don't have a lot of experience in it, put put that in um, into this list because this is going to help inform um, the process in the way that uh, shows that you, you, you're going to 
always have that as a key element of whatever kind of design that you're doing. So just do out, take out the list, write, and then write the answer to the question, what makes you you, what makes you different to other designers? The next step is to choose a niche. And this is where a lot of people just go completely wrong. <laughs> so I just really want to clarify right at the beginning, interior styling, interior decorating, feng shui, color consulting, virtual e-design, full service design. These are not niches. These are services. These are interior design services that could possibly be informed by your niche. So if you think your niche is e-design, uh, it's not. <laughs> um, it can't be. It's, it's, it's not a market niche. It's, uh, it's a service that interior designers provide. So I think this is really confusing because obviously there is information on the internet that says, and there's interior designers out there saying that their niche is an interior e-design, e but um, it's, it's not... It's not a niche. It's it's an interior design service. Um, you can specialize in a service um, by providing that service, but um, there's, you still need another niche. Um, well, you need a niche, which uh, e-design is not a niche. So another thing I think people confuse with a niche um, that isn't a niche is a process. So people also say things like from concept to completion or working collaboratively or providing a personalized service. This is what all interior designers do. <laughs> so um, it's also a process of the way that we work. It's not a niche. So I think this is really quite important to um, consider. So what is a niche in that case? Um, well, a niche is like aged care. It could be working specifically on commercial um commercial residentials, which is uh, developers, landlords, staging homes, things like that. Uh, conservation or heritage homes, it could be defence um, uh, or uh, uh, government projects, education, event design, exhibition design, government, uh, other government public projects like museums, libraries. Luxury is, luxury is a hard one because it is a niche, but it also has sub-niches. So um, depending on where you are in the luxury market, um, but uh, we can go into that once we get into sub-niches. Uh, then private residential, things like set and stage design, I think I said that, uh, transportation. So there's quite a broad a broad set of um, markets that uh, interior designers can work in. And obviously, a lot of interior designers really just focus on, well, if they're in the luxury market, they might do uh, transportation. So yachts, luxury cruises, luxury um, uh, uh, aircraft and um, yachts, uh, as well as high-end residential. So, or, and then also sometimes commercial. So you can have more than one main niche, but if you're just starting out, don't. I would just suggest choosing one niche and focusing your efforts. And I would say the reason for that is because at the beginning, there's so much other things going on that it's really hard to uh, focus your energy on something uh, when you're trying to deal with two d separate niches. Also, most people don't have enough uh, visual content like a portfolio to make it all balance out. So, for example, like I was saying, you could still have a style as a niche. So, if you're doing commercial and um, residential quite clearly with a specific niche, just think Kelly Wessler, um, it's it, it, with a very specific style. This is, I mean... Kelly does residential, but she also does um, uh, uh, commercial. But you can see her style very, very clearly. So uh, her niche is really quite obvious. Uh, and she can have the two market niches there. Well, because she can see uh, uh, the residential and commercial. And it's, it, it's, it's, it's a visually um, connected um market that people can really relate to and they know what they want when they're getting Kelly Wurstler. But for a lot of people who are starting out, unless they do have a very um, specific design style, um, it can be really confusing. So I would suggest not to do it um, unless you're a very experienced designer with a big portfolio and a lot of experience. Um, so yeah, so um, all you have to do is choose a main niche. Just choose one area of specialization um, uh, one, even if it's n not one that you have a lot of experience in, choose the niche that you really want to work in because this is where the beauty lies.
The next step is to choose an ideal client to work with. You've probably heard the terms target market, ideal client, client, client avatar. These are real things that are important when you're looking at your niche, mainly because as an interior designer, you need to understand the people that you're working with and the problem that you're solving for them. This is really key because it's intertwined with your niche as a designer. So there's kind of all of these elements that need to fit together and the people that you're going to be working with are key. <laughs> so this is one of the most important steps of creating a niche because you need to truly, truly choose but also uh, or decide on uh, on an ideal client type but also understand what it is that they're going to need from you and obviously understand if your skills match what it is that they need so how that all comes together beautifully in, uh, in your unique niche so who are we talking about we can have business people uh, so business owners restaurateurs bar owners uh, even uh, corporate uh, people, so CEOs, entrepreneurs, You've got downsizers. Uh, so downsizers might have an issue of, um, well, they have too much furniture to take to the new property and they don't know what to keep. So things like that. You've also got families with either young children, teenage children or uh, who, who are now older, adults and living at home and perhaps have a multi-generational um, living scenario. You also have uh, landlords uh, who obviously are in the commercial market, but um, landlords will be looking to, you, you have HMOs, uh, so houses of multiple occupancy, people ha house sharing, uh, you've got single occupied homes, you've also got um, uh, government uh, provided subsidised homes. So all of these have different types of um, issues that, the landlord needs to deal with where do they get the furniture from do they furnish it do they not furnish it um what kind of you know are they converting it into an hmo which is this is why they've contacted you other people are retirees retirees have specific needs uh they're thinking about aging in their properties um they're going to request you know very specific things from you like obviously um possibly accessible uh solutions in their home what about, uh, you've also got small space living, people who have, uh, you know, tiny houses or um, uh, 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 inner city living and have require very um, imaginative solutions to their very, very small spaces. So you can see that, I mean, there's a whole list. So if you go onto the blog, you can obviously choose um I've got a list there for you. But you can see how understanding the actual client themselves and the problem that they're going to need uh, with their kind of unique property type, that all kind of starts to come together, which I think is very unique to architecture and interiors because this, um, you know, it's not as simple as just creating a market and, I, and an ideal client. You need to understand a lot more, which is the problems that come with the property that they've got or that they're um, planning on purchasing. So, uh, or extending. So, uh, these kind of unique elements uh, all need to be thought about. So the next thing is to choose your ideal client type. If you need help with this, obviously go to the blog post and you can download the worksheet or um, you've got uh, a whole list there that you can go through. And um, then write out the typical problem that your ideal client has that you can help solve. Step four, choose a sub niche. This is where the complexity lies and this is also where the beauty is of creating your niche. It's not one of it's not something that every single interior designer needs because you might have already been able to really focus your market in a sweet spot. But for some of us this might have um, it might require uh, a little bit more of niching down. So this is why we have uh, this area of the sub niche. So, for example, if I was, well, uh, I do residential design. Uh, I do just say let's do commercial design, and um, with commercial, I work with entrepreneurs. But that isn't enough because that's pretty much still a really huge area of the market, which just it doesn't really speak to anybody. So, choosing something like 
well, specializing in biophilic design perhaps or sustainable design. Yes, they're services, so this is where the complexity comes in, but they're still um, – uh, this is where you can start to now hone in on how this uh, really creates your speciality. So, um, again, biophilic design is still something not very known. And so it's very, very niche. And so that really automatically just closes your market really, really small. So you might need to now go back and open up your market slightly because um, there might not just be enough work for biophilic design um, because commercial clients might not understand what it is yet so again these things will develop over time but um, that just means that in your marketing you're going to need to understand that you're going to be doing a lot of educating and telling people what it is that you do and understand helping people understand what biophilic design is so imagine if you're a commercial designer working with um, uh, entrepreneurs and you've decided to focus on biophilic design this really really narrows down your niche this I mean, still, that is a really nice niche to work on, but it could be a little bit too small. So you might have to go back up and um, choose entrepreneurs and uh, or choose commercial and residential. And then now you're starting to open it up a little bit more. These are, the sub-niche area is difficult because um, you need a little bit of typical, uh, typically uh, trial and error or a little bit of guidance because uh, somebody who understands market, uh, the marketing or marketing interior design but also um, interior design clients. So this really comes from experience and but it doesn't mean you can't do it, especially if you're just starting out, just keep it simple rather than overcomplicating it. And this is where, for example, you can really just hone in and just enjoy what it is that you're really working on so let's just say residential because this is going to be what a lot of you work on residential you want to work with professionals or let's just say residential families and period properties so a nice sub niche is a house style which is a period property so this is a really nice um, little niche of the market um, and that is a perfect niche to work on so you've got uh, residential uh, family working with families who own period properties and making those fit for um, today's living. So within this, you need to understand what the problems are that these clients that you're going to be working with have. So once you've got that, you can now um, really bring it all together and try and kind of round off this niche and kind of complete it. So where's the missing element to kind of really create a specialization the blog post will really help you with this because i've obviously given you um, a list of what some sub niches could possibly be client type it could actually be you know again a family is professional so you could actually sub niche into another um sub niche of um a, a family or a um, a client type you could niche into a period property type so even more so you could, instead of just a period properties as a, as a blanket, you could even niche down further into just simply Victorian properties or uh, what you call brownstones in the US. So you could just work on that specific type of property uh, for families in the residential sector. So you can see how this really, really narrows it down. It doesn't mean that other people aren't going to get in touch with you. And I think this is really key. It just means that it's really clear what it is that you're an expert in and it gives you a voice and a, kind of an area of the market to really shine. So this is the step that, I mean, again, if, you, if you've if you got a really clear niche and style right at the beginning, so if, you're, uh, if you, you've just got a signature style that is so clear, everybody knows, every, you're known for that style, you're possibly not going to need a sub-niche. So this is where... The beauty lies, but also the complexity lies. Give yourself the time to choose a good sub-niche um, if you need one. So that is the key. And now finally, the last step is to piece it together. This is going to take a few kind of rewriting. You're going to have to rewrite it a few times. The way I would suggest doing it is saying it out loud. Just say what it is that you do. And try and piece those bits and pieces together. So you just write them next to each other and see how you can kind of form the sentence together. And really enjoy creating your expertise, your specialization in interior design. Even if it's aspirational at this point, 
it's just a focus. And this is really where the beauty of creating a niche comes in. So enjoy this step. Create your elevator pitch and just put it all together. Make it work, even if it requires a, a bit of revision. You did it. So remember, creating an interior design niche can be unbelievably easy for some people and then unbelievably hard for others. So wherever you stand in that, wherever you are, know that it's possible to create a really fantastic niche. So don't give up. Give this a try. If you need a little bit of extra help, download the downloadable, go to the um, blog post and go through and have a look. Uh, get use all the prompts and just take this really seriously because you cannot start marketing your interior design business until you have a niche. So I'm Jo Crowback. I'm an architectural and interior designer. I'm also the CEO of the Interior Designers Business School here in London.